Okay. T. Okay, folks, uh, we're going to, uh, to call to order at this point. Sego ani buju endio wachea kwe kwe. As the mayor of the city of Kingston, I offer these words in the spirit of this gathering. Let us bring our good minds and hearts together as one to honor and celebrate these traditional lands as a gathering place of the original peoples and their ancestors who were entrusted to care for Mother Earth since time immemorial. It is with deep humility that we acknowledge and offer our gratitude for their contributions to this community, having respect for all as we share this space now and walk side by side into the future. So we were just meeting in a committee of the whole closed meeting. Uh, we did discuss a couple of different items. One, uh, one with respect to negotiations with the uh, Kingston Professional Firefighters Association. Uh, and then also discussion on uh, creating a clean tech innovation and commercialization hub. So I will ask for a motion to rise without reporting, please. Moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that council rise from the Committee of the Whole closed meeting without reporting. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, next we'll uh, move to the approval of the adds. We have two sets of adds to, uh, to approve on those added, we have uh, several additional uh, delegations. We have a motion of condolence, uh, and then we have also an additional staff report uh, on the CAO recommendation file. Can I have a mover and a seconder for the added, please? Moved by Councillor Doherty, seconded by Councillor Osanek. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, are there any disclosures of potential pecuniary interest? Okay, seeing none, we have no presentations this evening, but we do have several delegations. Uh, so first, I'll invite Meg Ferriman, Director of Student Life at Queen's University, and Callum Robertson, Vice President of University Affairs, Alma Mater Society, who will appear before Council to speak to Clause 4, Report Number 67 from the CAO, with respect to the request for noise exemption, Queen's University Orientation Week events. Uh, and just a reminder, as always, to our delegations that you have up to five minutes to speak, and then I will open up the floor to questions from members of council. Uh, so with that, I see uh, Mr. Robertson is there. Uh, Mr. Robertson, if you can hear me, you have the floor. Okay, so I think we're we're having some some challenges connecting with the delegation. So I think what I'll propose then is that we'll move on, uh, and then if uh, if the delegation reconnects with uh, with audio and video, then we can come back to them. So we'll move then to our second delegation. Uh, we'll invite Don Amos to appear before council to speak to Clause Seven of Report Number Sixty Seven from the CAO with respect to the Seniors Association Kingston Region Amendment to Purchase of Service Agreement. Uh, Mr. Amos, there we go. 
Mr. Amos, welcome, and uh, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mayor Patterson and councillors for this opportunity. I know I don't have much time, so I'll keep it brief and uh, high level as best I can. Uh, what is the phone from home program? It's uh, a call-in telephone program that runs twice a day, uh, once in the morning and again in the afternoon in one hour blocks. Requirements needed to participate is a phone. No membership to the Seniors Association and no program fees. To the participant, the program is completely free. All done from the comfort of the individual's home. What can they learn? I know through Exhibit A from the report that CAO Lanny Hurdle submitted, that you have an outline of some of the program offerings that have taken place in the past year. Activities focused on history, games, special interest speakers, and general information. Presentations take place over the phone, generally 45 minutes, and then a question and answer period afterwards. Other programs are games that stimulate their curiosity, where individuals are put on teams to share an experience of the game with others, once again, from the comfort of their home. Who is it meant for? This program is geared to the individual who has a difficult time getting out of their home. If through their social economic conditions and circumstances, any physical impairments or concerns from the current pandemic conditions. Older adults have had a very difficult time the last two years, especially with COVID-19 lockdowns, masking, double vaccination, and now two booster shots. This program has provided an opportunity to create a new network of contacts for them. They can have a conversation that day where normally they wouldn't talk to anyone that whole day or for several days at a time. Loneliness is a very real thing for seniors and this program has helped reduce the feelings of isolation and loneliness. Laughter, especially in the games time slot will often be heard if you walk past our facilitator's office, Melanie. You often hear comments about the games, comments about presentations, which leads to good conversations and building of friendships. How have we reached seniors? We've tapped into church bulletins. We've done flyers through the Seniors Good Food Box program, advertising in the Kingston this week, as well as social media. In June of 2022, the National Institute on Aging released a new report entitled Understanding Social Isolation and Loneliness Among Older Canadians and How to Address It. Both social isolation and loneliness have linked to a range of poor health outcomes among older adults. The health effects of prolonged social isolation have been found to equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Adults over 50 experiencing social isolation or loneliness are 50% more likely to develop dementia, 32% more likely to have a stroke, and at a 45% greater risk of premature death. The phone from home program breaks down barriers of loneliness and isolation. It's free. The program provides mental stimulation emotional connection to the other participants, and an opportunity to engage in meaningful conversation with their peers. The Seniors Association is requesting $30,000 to continue running this valuable program to the older adult population of Kingston. This will keep the program free for all to enjoy. I'd be happy to take any questions that Council may have about the program at this time. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions from Council? Okay, I uh, seeing none, none, Mr. Amos, thank you very much. Uh, with, with that, we'll move to our next delegation. We will invite Lana Cassidy to appear before council to speak to clause one, report number 69 from the Arts, Recreation, Community Policies Committee with respect to the Parks and Recreation Master Plan information on indoor, outdoor, multi-sport courts and costs for future planning of aquatic facilities. Good evening and thank you for providing this opportunity to comment. I've read the June 23 report for Parks and Recreation Master Plan by Peter Oejimbos and Brad Joyce. I'd like to comment on two aspects of the report. First about indoor swimming opportunities and second about pickleball. Regarding indoor swimming opportunities, 
The costs for adding indoor swimming to Invista are not participant neutral, and all citizens will bear a cost for this opportunity, which is the same case for any other recreation, since not all citizens use all facilities available to them. However, the ongoing operating costs for an indoor pool are far greater than other recreation spaces. Having an indoor swimming opportunity closer to home is a welcome idea if, as in an ice pad use, there are higher user fees to cover the cost. Second, to comment on the city's response to the growing popularity of pickleball. I completely appreciate the enthusiasm for the game and the desire to play it outdoors. It's simple to learn and all ages can participate. I have read that there is conflict growing across the country related to the noise of pickleball played close to homes. I am hopeful that the City of Kingston planning will ensure that all citizens have quiet enjoyment of their homes. And as George Harvey, Mayor of Delta BC, says all citizens have the right to livability in their backyards. It can be quite annoying, he said. It's like a perpetual aluminum bat hitting a baseball. I know it's just not me trying to endure the constant noise. The following I'm quoting from a comment from the Global Mail. The town of Niagara on the lake is currently defending against a law lawsuit by a homeowner who lives next to outdoor pickleball courts. The town moved the pickleballers inside the community center until the lawsuit is settled. I played duplicate bridge in a section of the community center with pickleballers on the other side of the partition. I can attest to the annoyance of the repetitive sound. The bl bridge club rents the use of the space for four hours. I can tolerate the noise for the duration of the weekly bridge game, but would not want to listen to the repetitive sound day in and day out all day long. Pickleball may be a healthy activity, but affected residents should not be expected to tolerate the noise. An update to that comment is that the town was actually fined in a probation of two years from pickleball at that specific outdoor lo location. I live directly behind the Henderson tennis courts. I understand the original uh, and updated plan is to remove the pickleball from the Henderson tennis courts once the Bay Ridge courts are opened. I am more hopeful that, more than hopeful, that the removal will occur this summer. I have endur endured this noise since I moved to this house five years ago. It's affecting my mental health. I cannot sit on my back deck and read a book. I cannot have my back windows open. I can even hear the pickleball hit the paddle with my windows closed. And from a cost perspective, I'm also concerned about monitoring access and time of use since damage can occur to the courts. For example, the use of a snowblower and a shovel on the courts in the winter. I felt quite demoralized when I called the city to explain this and the response was laughter and a comment about the enthusiasm. The person at the city did not recognize the harm that was occurring to me. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions from council? Uh, Deputy Mayor Hill. Thanks, thanks Ms. Cassidy. Uh, I wonder, because we've also heard a, a lot from uh, folks uh, who enjoy pickleball. Uh, I'm wondering about, um, and they're concerned about the, you know, in the, in the intervening period when the, when the courts are being built, that uh, there, there will not be sufficient numbers of courts, particularly in the West End. So if, if there were limitations put on, on the use of the courts, for example, you, you mentioned, and I'd heard this as well, that's, that there were snowblowers on the courts at 6.30 in the morning in the wintertime. Um, if we were to limit it seasonally, and uh, for example, from the hours of nine to say six uh, during the day, um, in the intervening period, pro only until the, the, those courts, the new courts get built, would that be something that, that you think you and other residents that live around the courts could live with? If I understand correctly, the Bay Ridge courts are actually built um, and it's just a matter of um, putting them into service at this point. Um, so understand that that um, um, limited terms of use would have been welcome, but I also understand that they're imminently going to be put into service. Um, if it could be implemented immediately, I would welcome any kind of um, limiting of the perpetual and constant noise. Um, like I say, it is definitely affecting my mental health at this stage, and I don't have uh, livability in my own home. Okay, uh, Councillor Sanek. 
Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, through you, I, so I just wanted to follow up on what Councillor Hill was saying. So um, you don't see any time at all where pickleball players um, can play, and has it helped that they've gone, like the two courts that are set up at Henderson right now are now on the south side next to the parking lot, as opposed to where they have been in past summers, which is more in the corner uh, right where the backyards are. Yes, understand, and um, I have to thank um, a uh, staffer, Neil Unsworth, I believe is his name, um, for uh, help, helping facilitate that move. Unfortunately, I don't know what it is. The acoustics um, are such that the noise is still at such a high level that it is unbearable. Um, I welcome anyone to visit my um, backyard um, during the day and um, to try and appreciate the, the noise level and the, the constant of it. Um, I just want to reiterate, you know, I really appreciate the need for a space for the pickleballers. And that's why, you know, I have done as best I can to um, be patient with everyone involved in the planning. I thoroughly understand it takes time. Um, and uh, that's why I'm now at the point of being actually kind of anxious um, to have them removed, knowing that there is another solution that is hopefully uh, better for both the pickleball players having a new surface and um, for the people that will be um, close to them with the sound berm. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay, uh, Ms. Cassidy, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll move uh, move on. We do have two additional delegations, but we need to formally add them to our agenda. So first, uh, moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Kiley, that uh, clauses 12.9 and 12.11 of our procedural bylaw be waived to allow Robert Hurtubais, Friends of Henderson Park, to appear before Council to speak to, uh, again, Clause 1 of Report Number 69 with respect to uh, information, indoor, outdoor, multiple sports courts, and costs for future planning of aquatic facilities. All those in favour? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, and then, uh, finally, moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Kiley, that, again, our procedural bylaw be waived to allow Roger Healy from the Kingston Coalition for Active Transportation to appear before Council to speak to Clause 3 of Report Number 68 from the CAO with respect to the School Street and Play Street program extension. All those in favour? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, okay, so with those two additional uh, delegations, at this point I will invite uh, Mr. Hutubais from the Friends of Henderson Park to uh, speak to Council. There we go. Sir, welcome, and uh, I will hand the floor over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you to, to the member of the council for letting us do this presentation today. Um, okay, I'm not sure how this is going to work for the presentation itself. Do I... The PowerPoint presentation, do I just... Does somebody move it down, or...? Yes, Mr. Hurtubis, somebody will be advancing the slides when you ask, when you tell them next slide, please. Okay, okay, great, thank you. Okay, so the subject is a follow-up to the previous presentation. It's, uh, if we move to the next slide, please. Uh, we greatly appreciate all the work that's been done by the city, city staff to address the issues that were presented uh, in 2021 relating to the parks the recreation master plan update. Um, they did some great work. Uh, however, we there's some revisions that we were proposing. Uh, we understand that there's been some noise complaints about Bay Ridge and about Anderson, but uh, re removing the courts from Anderson and then removing the courts from Bay Ridge two years down the road after they're open just doesn't make sense to us. Uh, next slide, please. If we look at the request made by City Council on, uh, on May 4, 2021, uh, staff were directed to report back to the Arts and Recreation Com Committee Policy Committee 
on a court implementation plan to increase the service level of tennis courts and pickleball above the service level. This include accelerating the permanent uh, pickleball courts at Bell Park, lighting, tennis walls, an alternate option to the reduction of tennis courts or courts for pickleball at Anderson Park. Next slide, please. I'm not sure if you can see the picture that we've got from Anderson Park. And like Councillor Osanic indicated, the courts have been moved to the closer part of the pool. They were closer to the residents before. I've been at Anderson Park on a number of instances. I understand that neighbors are complaining about the noise of pickleball, but how come they're not complaining about all the noise from the pool and the music that blasting at the pools? I played there on Friday last week, like I was just beside the pool and I couldn't hear the, the balls rattling off our rackets because uh, there was a ghetto blaster on it just beside us and everything else. So the noise is outrageous. So if you're gonna do something with pickleball, you, the next thing people are gonna ask about the pool to get it that close to. If cities really wants to remove the courts from there, before you do anything like this, I would suggest take a closer look at it. And even an option would be bring it down to two courts. The two courts closest to the pool should suffice. I don't, but we would prefer to keep the four courts. The problem is if you close Anderson Park, the West End is gonna end up with just four courts. Before we had some courts at Bay Ridge before the construction, and we had some courts at Anderson. Now you're cutting down from eight to four courts. The only place for the people from the West End to come and play, or they want some place to play in the city, would be for them to drive all the way down to either Belt Park, and we know that's not the best place to go play right now, or Riverview Park, close to Leon Center. So that's the situation with Anderson Park. We're, we're saying there's noise, but there's other, what, pick up all is not the only noise that's there. Next slide, please. Now, the other issue, issue we don't really understand is the city wants to remove the four courts from Bay Ridge once the court at Cat West Park are built. So the courts are not even open. The new courts are not even open. They're supposed to open in a week or two. And we're already talking about removing them. I don't know. Like we got, we requested money from the feds and the province to build these new courts. And then we're gonna tear some of them down. 30 seconds. Excuse me? Oh, sorry, just wanna let you have 30 seconds left. Okay, if you wanna do something, I would suggest that if we cannot leave them there, the city has spent a lot of money setting up noise reductions, burns, trees, and everything else. So let's test them first, see what happens. If there is some nice noise, noise complaints, we should be looking at here again, converting the, the tennis court to a multi-use court with only two pickleball courts. Okay. Next slide, please. Thank, just. thank, thank you. So, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna pause you there, sir, and I'm just gonna open up the floor to uh, to council. Are there any questions, Councillor Osanek? Thank you, Your Worship. Through you, thanks very much for the delegation. I just wanted to get your opinion about two things. Um, what time do you, does your club, like I know like it's your group, right? And you're there almost every um, weekday playing at the Henderson Courts. Well, um, no. do, do you start at nine o'clock or 10 o'clock? What time do you start? Do you think if we could switch just a little bit of a later start time, that could help? Can I speak? Okay. I would agree with it. Usually a lot of people would start around 8.30. But if you can move it to nine o'clock, I'm sure people would be in agreement with that. It's, we prefer to have the courts, even if there's a restricted use, of, use time of use set up. But like usually we're on the courts around 8.30, we start setting up the nets and everything else. By 10 to nine, we're, we're starting to play. I personally play more in the East End, Green Deer Park, mm -hmm. and at Buddy. I've been involved with Phil and everything else on these discussions, so. 
Okay, thank you. And my second question is, one thing I've read is that um, if you play pickleball indoors, you, it's a quieter ball, and some communities require that indoor ball to be used on outdoor courts just because it does um, keep down the noise. Could that be an option that council considers for Henderson, just, just for Henderson, because of the noise issues there? Okay, I wasn't aware that there was differences in the noise level, but if there is, it wouldn't be an issue. Uh, the balls, hey, on a windy day, doesn't matter what kind of ball you're using, it's still gonna blow uh, okay. sideways and things like that. So no, it, it wouldn't be an issue. We can probably use the okay. indoor ball to play outdoor. Okay, thank you. Okay, next is Deputy Mayor Hilt. Hey, thank you, Mr. Herdebees. I'm the uh, counselor for uh, uh, Lakeside, and, and um, a lot of the folks that are living around the courts, particularly at Henderson, uh, would have purchased their houses before pickleball became a popular sport and was, was being played there. So I know it's, it's been a challenge for, for you folks because you're trying to find facilities to use, and I, I, and I know it's been a challenge for some of the residents there. So it's good to hear that you're, you're willing to uh, uh, entertain some of the suggestions that uh, Councillor Osanek has, has made. I, and I guess that's my, my question to you uh, is, you know, are, are you you're willing to sit down and kind of negotiate some of the provisions that you need in order to keep the courts open until the new courts are built so that uh, um, you can accommodate the interests of some of these residents who've been there, as you can imagine, for quite some time. So is that what I'm hearing from you, that you're quite open to that? Yeah, I think that we're open to discussion. We're, we, uh, I met... Well, we had a Zoom call last week with uh, Neil and Luke, and we discussed those options. What we were quite open, receptive to whatever the city is proposing. Time of use, uh, risk, like you said, even the balls, and if we have to, if can, if we can't keep four courts, can we keep two there, the closest one to the pool? And maybe there's other options as to what can be do with the fence and things like that to reduce the noise. Would you say that the majority of the of the users, like by far, would be people who are associated with your club, or is there a lot of independent users of those courts? Because I'm just thinking about, you know, I, it's great that you would agree to to assist us, but are there people who might not? I think the majority of the people would be supportive of this. Um, there's been a lot of emails going back and forth with this from the different people. And I was there Friday afternoon talking to some of the group in the afternoon. And yeah, they, they're looking forward to Bay Ridge, but there again, they're saying, move us to Bay Ridge. We're still stuck with only four courts. We, they've been waiting for Bay Ridge to open. So they could, that's the other thing. If you spread right now, all the groups are playing at Bay Ridge because there's no nowhere else, okay? If you open Bay Ridge, then the crowds are gonna split split up a little bit. You'll have some people playing, going to play at Bay Ridge, you'll have some people playing at Anderson, which is gonna cut down the volume, the noise, and everything else. Uh, okay, that, that's okay. great. Thank you, Mr. Hurtis. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions for the delegation? Uh, Councillor Strapp. Thank you, Mr. Yurtubis. I was wondering if you could help uh, a council and members of public that are watching, trying to really get to the heart of, of what you think, where the friction lies in and, and the source of the complaints. I mean, we've heard, uh, you know, firsthand accounts from the previous delegation, but you play the game. You must have uh, heard people commenting on what it sounds like. And if there are noise complaints, what what is it really that causes these persistent noise complaints when it comes to pickleball? The main, the main complaint, like even I, I spent the three or four months down in Florida, uh, one place where we rented uh, was about you know, three houses down from the, the courts. There were six courts on the go. The issue there is that at 6.30 in the morning, you've got the players are up there. They're... 
the courts are almost full at 6.30 in the morning. So that's the big issue. I think people want to have some quiet time. If you start after breakfast, let's say reasonable hour, 8.30, 9 o'clock, people would not be as upset. It's just people like to sleep in and enjoy their breakfast. Uh, situation in Florida, and I think it's the same down here, the courts in the afternoon are not that busy. People come out, they play in the morning, they try to get off the court around one o'clock. And some of the people that are working might come out after work around 4.30 or something like that before supper and come and play. I can't speak for the people that might be playing at seven o'clock. I don't know. There's, I've never really been on the courts at seven o'clock at night. And the other issue, like Warmore and Grenadier Park, which is okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, so what you're saying is essentially uh, it it it's, it it creates a noise that prevents people from sleeping. It's like the ping pong ball noise of the racket hitting the ball if it starts yeah. too early in the morning. But the, the reason people are going so early in the morning is because in the summertime it gets very hot in the afternoon and it's the best time to play. It's the same thing with golf, right? So, so uh, but you, you've already said you're, you're willing to have a later start time or a reasonable start time and you're willing to use these indoor balls which maybe make a little bit less noise. Is there any uh, other... Uh, ways to mitigate the noise? I mean, this isn't like a new problem with pickleball. Like the racket hitting the ball, it, it resonates. So what, what are the International Pickleball Association suggesting to do about this? I, I have no real, I've never heard of other ish, ways to resolve the issues. I know some uh, companies are trying to develop a paddle also that's not as noisy because the ball itself, it's when it hits the paddle itself, it's a banging noise that you hear. Like, oh, honestly. Okay, no, it's okay. We, we, we know. We, 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 we appreciate the offer for the demonstration. We, 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 uh, we understand the noise. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. Can, I, can I just say a word? Yeah, you can just finish your answer to Councilor Strutt. Okay. The other issue is more also, some of the complaints I've heard is that if you've got six or seven courts on the go, you've got a lot of people there, and people are having fun. So there's a lot of laughing, there's a lot of yelling and things like that. So it's, but what can you do? People are there. I know I've got a couple of people on our, our group. From time to time, we've got to remind them, keep it down a little bit. Because so, that's it. That's all I have to say. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Okay, uh, Mr. Hudibees, thank you very much. Uh, you. With, so with that, we'll move to our next delegation, and I, I do believe that our first delegation is now connected. So at this point, I will circle back, uh, and we will uh, give the floor over to, if I can find them here, uh, to uh, Meg Fairman and Callum Robertson uh, to speak to the uh, Request for Noise Exemption Queen's University Orientation Week events. Oh, Mr. Robertson, welcome, and you have the floor. Thank you, everybody. Um, I please uh, apologize for the, the earlier mishap. Uh, technology is not on my side today. But um, good evening, everybody, and thank you to City Council for giving us the opportunity to become come before you in support of our application. Um, just personally, my name is Callum Robertson. I am the Vice President of University Affairs for the Alma Mater Student Society of Queen's University. I oversee the campus affairs and orientation departments within our organization. And so I overall oversee the, the larger student-led orientation week here at Queen's University. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about the joint application made between Queen's University and the Alma Mater Society that's being, being made to request exemptions to the city's noise bylaw, as well as requesting the use of public property and associated road and lane closures uh, during our orientation week this year. This application centers around Queen's University Orientation Week, where incoming students are welcome to our campus and to the city of Kingston uh, for the first time, and they take part in a number of activities between two weekends. This year, those two weekends would fall between September 3rd and 5th and September 9th and 11th. 
Events will take place, place both on Queen's main campus and our West campuses, as well as a number of city parks and green spaces if this application goes through. I just want to you know, talk about uh, what this event and what these, this week means to our students, um, because we're welcoming these new students to the Kingston community. Um, and I think it's a vital experience. I know to me it was a vital experience that each Queen student takes part in during their first year, during their first week here at Queen. And after two years of online and hybrid orientation weeks, um, we're looking forward to this more in-person and normal quote unquote orientation week. I think with Queen students fully returning in person to Kingston this year, we want to welcome these new students by showing them the vitality of the city itself uh, through orientation week, through the use of these public spaces, um, and through the events that we plan. Um, to, I know in the past there have been some questions about the importance of orientation week, and so I want to under, underscore, pardon, why orientation week is so important, not just to our organization, but also to the council and to the city as a whole. Um, it, this orientation week provides an organized, structured introduction for incoming students to both the university and the city of Kingston itself. Through the events, presentations, and discussions that we have during this week, we facilitate a successful transition to university life, where most of the students who are coming in are for the first time living independently. These students need this structured time, this environment where the university and their felt their peers uh, can guide them through this transition. And I think I, I personally benefited from this in my first year, um, but I've heard countless stories from other students of how, while it was initially shocking to, to live on their own those first few nights at Queen's, orientation week provides a safe and structured environment for them to really learn about the city that they're living in because they're new residents to the city. Ultimately, what we're asking of the City Council is to allow us these exemptions in order to welcome new residents to the city. Um, these residents will, you know, I remember during my first week at Queens during orientation week, I spent time in City Park where I now walk through every day on my way to work. Um, I spent time in Victoria Park and a number of green spaces throughout the city, and I got to see the character of Kingston. And as somebody who had never been to Kingston before coming to Queens, like many of our students, orientation week provided me a way to see the beauty of the city, and I think a lot of students benefit from that. Over the past several months, our team has been working with staff from the city of Kingston to create a proposal and to create an application that works for both of our organizations, um, between us and the city. And we hope that you'll see the mirror in this application. Queen's orientation is a time-honored tradition for both Queen students and for the city of Kingston itself as these incoming students are shown the incredible parks, green spaces, and amenities given to them by the city. I hope that you'll agree with us uh, on the importance of this re return to an in-person orientation week, and we hope that you'll grant our request. Um, and I want to thank you so much for your time and your attention today. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions from Council? Councillor Stratt? Thank you, Mr. Robertson, for coming to us. It's clear that your passion for uh, uh, for the uh, Queen's experience, is, it comes clear, uh, loud and clear in your presentation. I don't think anyone disputes the importance of a good orientation week for Queen's. I myself went to Queen's, I went through Frosh Week and can remember uh, many of those events are still alive today, uh, you know, a couple decades later. Uh, the, the friction, uh, I represent the area around the main campus and the friction that I hear about from residents has to do with the way that the parks, uh, so in my case it would be City Park, uh, are essentially uh, occupied by Frosh Week during that time and, uh, and no one else can use them during those events because of the numbers and, you know, and, and there's caution tape put up and things are cordoned off and, you know. So the, the question, the first question is, so no one disputes the importance of Orientation Week. The question might be, where to locate the events. And I think it's only fair if uh, Queen's facilities and property are maximized uh, in their use before we start taking uh, parks away from ordinary citizens for the events. So my question is, is to you or to anyone, uh, if you've got another delegate there, are the Queen's uh, spaces that could be used for these events at maximum capacity for, the, for this request? 
Mr. Robertson. Yes, thank you for the question, Councilor. Um, that's, that's a great question, and I think you're absolutely right that we, we share the city with the residents of Kingston. Um, and so what I have found is in our application, we list all the places where each of our major events are taking place. Um, and I can say that I, I believe that we are using most almost all of our spaces to maximum capacity. Um, and one thing I will highlight, again, is actually that we are splitting up our events between two, two separate weekends. Um, and so I think that gives residents much more time in between. They'll have a full week to, you know, to, to not have events running in the parks. They'll have full use of the parks. Um, and I think this is, this is a new uh, schedule we're using this year. Um, and so we're hoping to, to see how this segmented orientation week uh, works. And I think it will work in favor of what you're talking about, um, you know, giving residents more time. And, uh, you know, I do believe that we are using all of our, group, our spaces on campus to the maximum capacities. Um, and I believe in the application, you can see a list of all the events that are taking place on each, uh, the locations of each event that are taking place. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for your question. I hope that is sufficient. Thank you. And, and I know, I mean, you're, you're AMS, you don't uh, control all the facilities, uh, but I would, I would just say that if what you said is true, that means Nixon Field, Richardson Stadium, all the West Campus fields, the grass and the artificial, all of these surfaces are used. Uh, before the parks are used. If, if what you say is true, I, I will definitely will be observing this year to see if that is true. My follow-up question has to do with uh, actual, uh, uh, so th through access uh, during events. So I witnessed firsthand a few years ago, two or three years ago, it was, I, I think it was the Thunder Mugs uh, event in City Park. They had, they put up caution tape because, you know, uh, for some of those, uh, you know, events, you don't want it, you, you want it in a, a designated area. But they, they uh, in it, um, mistakenly cordoned off several of the cross paths, like the paths that cross City Park, the ones you were talking about when you go to work. And uh, so then uh, I was getting complaints from residents that couldn't get to work themselves because the whole park was being cordoned off. So I, I was gonna ask if you could uh, assure me that you pass on to the organizers that all the pathways through the park are uh, intact during the events and that uh, access is okay. not obstructed. Mr. Robertson? Absolutely, thank you, Councillor. Um, yeah, I think that's that's more than reasonable. Um, I obviously, I can't speak to the last couple of years, but um, what I will say is that that's, yeah, that was, I think, a management oversight. Um, and I'll be making that very clear to to my team and we'll have that disseminated to the, the individual faculties um, who run the events. Um, and I'll make that very clear to them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is Councillor Neal. Thank you very much. Um, can everybody hear me? I'm working from my... Uh, yes, yes, we so, can hear you, Councillor Neal. Thank you. Um, just a, a, a quick comment. I really appreciate when I did my frosh uh, week, it was primarily a pub crawl. And I know and I appreciate that you've moved on from it being only that event. I represent shared with with the previous councillor, uh, Victoria Park. Do you reach out and kind of knock on doors in the surrounding parks uh, to to let people know what's happening and to get feedback? Mr. Robertson? Um, thank you, Councillor, for your question. Um, I, I cannot say if we do have a program of that nature, um, but I will say if we don't have a program like that where we do community outreach, um, I am personally in favor of that. I'll be talking to my team about that. Um, I think that's a door knocking campaign I personally worked on with the city uh, last year. Um, have gone very smoothly when talking to residents, and so I think something similar could absolutely be be worked on um, in terms of reaching out to residents around Victoria Park. Councilor Neal, okay, thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions, uh, Mr. Robertson, thank you very much. And with that, we'll move to our fifth and final delegation this evening. We will now invite Roger Healy from the Kingston Coalition for Active Transportation to speak to council with respect to the School Street and Play Street program extension. 
Mr. Healy, if you're there, welcome, and you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mayor Patterson and council members. Um, I'm here to, on behalf of KCAT, to uh, present uh, just a brief overview of the school streets and play streets. And, and as you know, uh, they've been uh, piloted in the last year and, and have been quite, uh, quite successful. So I just wanted to give you a quick summary, uh, an overview of that. Um, but uh, uh, I'll start with, uh, if you could show the next slide, I'll start, start with what I think is a little known fact, uh, kind of separate, but, but I'll explain later where it connects, that most households in Kingston already have a, a solar power and wind power installation on their property. And I, and I think that'll be news to most people. Uh, if you show the next slide, here's a, a picture of um, of the one at my house, and um, for those of you who can't see, it's it's a clothesline, and uh, um, the uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, the um, I, I'll just show you the connection between a simple clothesline and uh, and what the school street and and play street um, uh, in, installations. So uh, first of all, um, they are very simple in design. And uh, I, I think in the case of a school street, it's, it's simply uh, closing, closing the street in front of a school for 30 minutes when, when school children and parents are most likely to be there at the beginning of school day and the end of, and another 30 minutes at the end of the school day. And it's proven to be quite effective at at reducing uh, traffic and con congestion and, and uh, improving the safety of, of everybody involved. Um, uh, this, this, the next point is of course that it's very inexpensive. And uh, um, I, think, uh, I think that's an important point to, to make with you that, that both, both the Play Street and the School Street are, are really inexpensive. They're dealt with uh, by by uh, adding adding the uh, simple barricades and uh, and uh, of course they re they require the second the second part of that that you don't really realize is that it requires a lot of uh, 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 of coordination from the volunteers and uh, and and participation by a lot of volunteers so it's been very effective that way. Um, and, uh, and of course, the, the very last point, which is probably the most important one, is that both the clothesline and, and the school street play streets require adequate, adequate supports at both ends uh, of, the, of the operation. So uh, in the case of school streets, it's, um, it's uh, of course, uh, city, the city has, has its part and the school boards or the school and the school boards have, have their part. And uh, in the case of the Play Street, of course, it's it's again the city, but uh, but it's more a question of uh, having the neighborhood uh, organized and and doing most of the volunteer work. So I'm just going to uh, again, that's that's really all I wanted to say tonight. I'll just show you a few slides quickly, uh, if you'll advance the slides. Uh, pictures of of the mostly of the school street uh, with that little 200 meter area in front of on Macdonnell in front of Winston Churchill Public School entrance. You get you see pictures of uh, parents and and little kids learning how to ride a bicycle, um, and uh, then you see the next slide. Uh, kids used to gather at the end of the school day, and 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 uh, there's a lot of socializing going on. And, and that's the sort of thing that, that we've really missed through the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. Um, it, it, this operates year round and uh, in the coldest days of the year and it is quite, it's quite practical to do it. And it's very important to do it uh, when there's a lot of snow because that can be a, sometimes a barrier to seeing little kids. Um, next slide, please. 30 seconds. Yeah, um, you can use toboggans and, and get around uh, any way you want. We've seen that. Uh, and the next slide, a couple interesting use for the bike rack is a storage for toboggans. And the next slide, uh, maybe, uh, yeah, just parents sharing with their kids at the end of the day. It's a lot calmer, a lot quieter. 
And uh, the, the last slide, I believe, is um, an, an illustration of the Play Street. I don't have many photos of the Play Street, but you can see uh, is, this was at November at, at a, only 6.30 p.m. Thank, thank you. Park, and thank, uh, kids really enjoyed it. Thank so, you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Are there any questions from Council? Councilor Stroud. I think members of the public and colleagues here would like to hear a little bit more about the play streets because that's kind of a, an evolution of the program and, and uh, maybe just for those watching tonight you could give us a little bit more information about uh, the upside of that and how that works. Uh, thank you, Councillor Stroud. Yes, the, the play street uh, is uh, another simple concept but it's, it's more, uh, the difference is that it it require, requires uh, more cooperation of the neighbors and, and pro providing most of the, the, the um, volunteer work. Uh, but uh, what it, it involves the same, same principle of just barricading the streets for very fixed periods of time throughout the week. And, and in this case, the first run was, was a very limited number. It was uh, two hours on a Saturday afternoon and one hour on a Tuesday evening. And, uh, and that, that's the li very limited time that it's available. But it, it's proven to be very important uh, uh, for children's activities, especially young children, uh, who, who uh, a lot of parents are leery of having their young kids uh, go off on their own to say, nearby parks, even if they're, if they're close by. And we have a lot of great parks available. But um, this, this provides an opportunity for parents and, and children to make use of the street in front of their house, to play informal games, to, uh, to engage in, in even semi-formal games of road hockey and basketball and, and all that kind of stuff that, that I think you've talked about uh, recently, um, including. So um, it's, it's just uh, well recognized that, that children just do not get enough activity these days and every little bit helps certainly helps and it, and it creates a, an atmosphere of uh, wanting to do more free play and that's what we're hoping to achieve there it sounds wonderful my follow-up would be in the choosing of the street for a play streets initiative uh, obviously there's outreach and so on from your organization uh, but the local residents have direct input into that decision? Uh, yes, again, thank you for the question. Uh, what we employed was a, a kind of a, a, I think, a Facebook uh, approach to a neighborhood. We targeted neighborhoods that had uh, a high number of children based on census data. And, uh, and we, we chose neighborhoods that initially were receptive to the idea. And then uh, we, we asked for submissions from, from various uh, neighbors uh, and asked them to, to explain why they, why they would make good use of a play street. And, uh, and we chose uh, the best in, of those responses. And again, we were looking for a lot of commitment on the, on the part of the parents to help support it uh, uh, with, with the volunteer time. Uh, but that's not to say that it, that in other situations uh, it might be possible to to engage more people in in activating, sort of providing more programming for the for a street closure, and uh, and a, 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 so neighborhoods that maybe don't have as an engaged a population could could still take advantage of a play street. Thank you, Mr. Healy. Okay, next is Councillor Neal. Thank you very much. Um, and I really appreciate what you've done at Winston Churchill. Both the mayor and I had an opportunity to uh, visit your open house there. I'm curious, are there other schools that have expressed an interest uh, in, in adopting the same program? Uh, thanks for the question. Yes, uh, th there have been uh, a number of people, ex a number of schools expressed interest, um, and uh, they, through the uh, the uh, school pedestrian safety working group, they they've, they've uh, at least approached that group, and uh, I've been contacted by a number of schools, um, and uh, basically we're 
we're at a point now based on the recommendations of that working group uh, where uh, and what you're you're going to uh, uh, discuss tonight is that uh, a possibility of, of expanding both uh, mainly the school street program at this point but but allowing transportation services to to uh, if you like uh, in uh, support those programs that qualify or that are best suited for it and uh, and transportation services uh, has already been very helpful in in making the pilot work so they're they're well aware of what's needed uh, in this case excellent and if you can confirm a rumor i heard uh uh, you've been invited to go to Dublin, Ireland, uh, to present the good work that you've done here in Kingston. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's true. I'm uh, I'm not going to be around for the last two weeks of September because I'll be in Dublin. Uh, uh, I've been invited to talk uh, at a Walk 21 conference in Dublin, and uh, uh, I'm hoping to um, promote the great work we're doing in Kingston. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is Councillor Doherty. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Healy. Um, I'd just like to use this opportunity to also thank KCAD for all of the great work. It's not easy. You mentioned that there are a lot of volunteers involved, and that requires a lot of coordination. On one of the slides, you talked about uh, how important it is uh, um, for support from the school board as well as support from the city. Well the city and neighborhoods wouldn't be able to have these kind of opportunities if it wasn't for the support and the hard work from KCAD. So, um, so thank you, thank you to everyone involved. Uh, my question is about um, the, the KCAD's capacity, um, a little bit like an extension of Councillor Neil's question, if we were to expand this, um, do you do you foresee that to be a huge challenge, or do a lot of the volunteers actually organically come from the schools in the neighborhood? You already mentioned that. So if you could just speak to, um, please, capacity issue. Thanks. Yes, thank you. That's a great question, Councillor Doherty. And um, uh, KCAT uh, is a very small organization, and we don't have a large capacity. We certainly don't have a payroll department and a human resources department or anything like that. Uh, but um, I guess uh, in answer to your question about the school streets, for example, uh, the the volunteers uh, would, um, it, it's hard It's hard to say in this pilot program, we, we had the advantage of it being very close to Queens um, and uh, we happened to hit this great mixture of, of students and retirees and parents and, and uh, uh, very dedicated individuals. So we were very lucky to have that, that volunteer resource. I just can't predict that it, the same resource would be available at other schools. Uh, however, um, uh, the, we've, we've presented other models where, where there could be a a, a, a combination volunteer slash paid uh, representation at these uh, as as workers on the volunteer uh, school streets. So there's a lot of possibilities that we have to explore. But um, we're working. We started work right now with with the school board with Limestone at least with with uh, discussions about uh, their involvement. So um, I, I, I guess the short answer is capacity maybe isn't, for, uh, for KCAD is not that great. However, we, we have a lot of uh, passion and we have a lot of uh, dedicated individuals. So uh, we wanna make sure that, that the pilot at least goes to the next phase of maybe three or four schools trying it again for this upcoming year. And uh, that may prove to be the uh, recipe for, for making it more extensively used in Kingston. Thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions, Mr. Healy, thank you very much. And with Thanks. that, we will uh, we'll move on in our agenda. So we have no further delegations. Uh, we have no briefings. Are there any petitions to present? Okay, seeing none, we do have one motion of uh, condolence. 
uh, moved by Mayor Patterson, seconded by Deputy Mayor Hill, that the sincere condolences of Kingston City Council will be extended to Muhammad Hassan, the city's manager of equity, diversity, and inclusion, on the passing of his father, uh, Mutaba Hussein, on Sunday, July 10th. Uh, Mutaba was an educator and a community builder. He de dedicated all his life in betterment of the educational system and supporting underprivileged communities. Our thoughts and prayers are with uh, Mutaba's family and friends at this difficult time. We will call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, moving on to deferred motions. We do have one deferred motion. Your Worship, yes. can I declare oh, yes. my plenary? Yes, Councilor Strub, my apologies. Yes, I will hand the floor over to you. No, no, it's my fault. I missed the pecuniary section. Um, yeah, so it's a statement of pecuniary interest. I, Peter Stroud of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of Clause 3, Report Number 67, the North Block Brownfields, uh, because I am actually a current tenant of Homestead Land Holdings. Okay, thank you very much. So on uh, deferred motions, we do have one deferred motion. Uh, it is to appoint a councillor uh, to participate in the review committee for operating grants for um, uh, in the, for, so this is with the director for heritage services. Um, and that is on September 19th and September 26th, so a two day commitment. Could I have a volunteer please? Any volunteers? Mr. Clerk, can I see you for a moment? Okay, so we will defer it to our next council meeting, give everybody another month to think about it. Can I have a mover and a seconder to defer? Moved by Councillor Chappelle, seconded by Councillor Osanic. All those in favor? Opposed, and that's carried. Okie dokie, on to reports. First up we have report number 67 from the CAO. Moved by Councillor Oosterhoff, seconded by Councillor Doherty, that report number 67 from the Chief Administrative Officer, consent be received and adopted. Okay, so there are, I was looking, there are nine clauses in a report number 67. Would anyone like any of them separated? Councillor McLaren? Number three, please. Number three. Councillor Osanek? Number two, please. Councillor Stroud? One, please. Okay, are there any other separations? So first we'll vote on the non-separated clauses. So clause four, request for noise exemption, Queen's University orientation week events. Clause five, noise exemption request, 2800 Clogs Road. Clause 6, Award of Contract, Delivery of Physiotherapy Programs, City of Kingston, Rita Crest Home. Clause 7, Seniors Association, Kingston Region, Amendment to Purchase of Service Agreement. I'm sorry, Councillor Chappelle? Okay, so we'll remove the, uh, that would be clause number 5. It's okay. Uh, clause number 8, Parking Bylaw Minor Amendments. And Clause 9, 2022 City of Kingston Arts Fund Grant Recommendations. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, so now circling back to the beginning, Clause 1, Award of Contract, Robert Bruce Memorial Parking Structure 2022 Restoration. Councillor Stroud. If you uh, read the report, you'll see the large sum of money that's uh, needed for this restoration, and you may think, uh, you know, this is, this is maintenance, this is a maintenance cost that we, we can't avoid. But I think before we commit that amount of public funds, we need to have a good understanding of the upsides and downsides. So we have a couple questions for staff. So um, one, I, the way I like to think about parking is that you, you have a cost, I mean, all, all parking is, is expensive, right? But you have a cost, you have a capital cost, you have um, operating costs and you have in this case, a maintenance cost down the road because this parking garage is quite, quite, uh, it's been around for a long time. And then you have your revenue from the parking, which you get every day. And is there any way we can, it's not in the report, but is there any way we can see the cost benefit analysis even in a very high level of uh, what this work 
performs, it, rather than taking uh, the, the position that this is uh, uh, necessary repairs. The, obviously, the alternative would be to decommission the garage and move in a different direction with this money. So perhaps staff could, could talk about maybe specifically how, how, what is the revenue of this garage uh, uh, on a yearly basis, and then we can compare it to the cost. Uh, yes, Commissioner Agnew. Yes, thank you, and through you, Mayor Patterson. I'm sorry, Councillor Stroud, I don't know off the top of my head what the revenue is associated with this particular um, parking structure. I would have to look into that and get back to you. Uh, we certainly do have that broken down by structure in, in terms of our overall parking revenues. I just don't have that information that's readily avail available to me right at the present time. I apologize for that. Yeah, it's too bad. It, it's hard to make a decision without that. Uh, I've got a different uh, thing to ask about. So, we, as you see in the report, there's only there was only one response with the bid, and uh, just for our consideration, is there any way we can keep the RFP open and or resubmit the RFP asking for more submissions? Uh, or and how time sensitive is this work? Commissioner Agnew? Uh, thank you and through you. I think we certainly, what we would have to do likely, um, depending on the, the detailed nature of, of how this was put out, this was actually put out by facilities, so I, I can't respond to that with 100% certainty. What we may have to do, in fact, Councillor Stroud, is uh, cancel it and reissue it, depending on if there was that the ability to hold the price for a certain period of time, and if we were able to do that within the time to report back to Council, I would have to pull the details from the actual RFP document um, with the facilities group. But those are generally the options. Thank you. I mean, I'm aware from, from being a downtown uh, guy that the, there is repairs, uh, you know, in the works of this place. It, it's not, it doesn't last forever, and without the repairs, it, it, it will not be functional. But it is currently functional. It's currently uh, allowing parking. And I'm wondering, it's not in the report, but if, uh, you know, if we resubmit the RFP and get some lower bids, because the construction rush, post-pandemic construction rush, you know, slowly subsides, uh, that we could actually maybe save some of this money. So uh, if it's not super time sensitive, I'm wondering about the feasibility of that. We don't have anyone here from facilities tonight? So I did notice that there were two hands that uh, were raised, but I, I couldn't see who they were. I'm not sure if there's anybody else from staff that wanted to jump in on this. We'll just pause for a second. Mr. Rempel. Hi. Good evening uh, to you, uh, Mayor Patterson. The, we only did get the one compliant bid. Uh, a second bidder did submit, but they didn't meet the minimum threshold. But I can tell you that uh, the cost estimates that were prepared by our consultant, uh, the bid that was received was a uh, very good bid under what was expected, the prices that was received for the scope of services that they're they're providing is a very good price in this market. Uh, we could certainly uh, cancel it. We would run the risk of sort of prices increasing versus what we have right now uh, compared to the estimate that we received from our consultant. We were very pleased with this number based on the extensive scope that they are that we are asking them to perform. Okay, uh, so do you have any, any, uh, any details over why this price looks so attractive? Because it's a pretty big number still. Uh, through you, Mayor Patterson, it's an extensive scope of work of restoration uh, and maintenance for the garage. It's, it's a great deal of work. So it is, it's well within the range of what we expected for this project. I kind of expected it to be a little higher, to tell you the truth. So I was very, very pleased with, with this number. It, it is an extensive work. I could certainly provide you a summary of the scope of services that's provided. It's, uh, it's also being done in, in quick order to over the next 
uh, four to five months to get it completed before uh, a heating season might interrupt the construction. So it's, I can give you really good details on the scope of service. It's, it's quite extensive. Well, it's just we don't have anything really to go on except what you're telling me right here tonight. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, the appearance. It, 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 your, your assertion that it, it appears to be cheap, but when you get a, a contractor that's offering to do a large project and the price seems low, that's usually a warning sign. So why why is it not so in this case? Mr. Rempel? Sorry, it, the, my audio just broke out. If you could repeat that. I was just saying that on a smaller scale, uh, when you get a, an estimate from a contractor that is lower than what you were expected, that, that's sometimes a warning sign because you wonder whether they'll be able to complete the work with a level of qual a quality standard that you're expecting. So why is that not the case in this instance, in the climate? It says right in the report, the climate of the post-pandemic construction uh, squeeze, and we're getting a, a, what looks like an attractive bid for this extensive work. Why is that not a warning sign? Definitely great point to you, uh, Mayor Patterson. We interviewed uh, Brook Restoration as part of the negotiation phase and uh, asked all those questions about how they would maintain quality, how they'd maintain the scope, how they meet the goals of the project, how they would mitigate risk, and we were we were very satisfied with their answers to that interview. It was about a about an hour and a half interview with them. No further questions. Thank you. Okay. Is there anybody else, Councillor Chappelle? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, two questions. One was this advertised on Bidingo, or was it also advertised on? on bids and tenders, or is it just limited to Bedingo? And second, if it was just on Bedingo, is this work critical to be done this year, or can we defer it to next year where we can have more competitive bids? Ms. Kennedy? Thank you. To the, uh, to the first question, no, the, uh, this would have been advertised on uh, Bedingo only, not on bids and tenders. There's been repeated uh, questions from myself on the bidding processes and the, and the procurement processes being utilized, suggesting that we look at utilizing alternative bidding sources because when you pull down mom and pop's fish and chips for a construction project, I don't think they're able to do the work. So I think we need to expand our network or just simply say no to these types of projects. Okay, thank you. Anybody else, Councillor Doherty? Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. Just wonder if we have a history working with Brook Restorations Limited. Like, do we know of their work? I think Councillor Stroud raised some really good questions. So, do do we know this co uh, company, uh, Mr. Rempel? Uh, through you, Mayor Patterson. Yes, we do. They are currently working on the garage uh, right now, doing some emergency shoring, uh, and we have worked with them in the past on other projects so we know how they behave themselves and that was part of the interview question. The issues we encountered with them in the past, we asked them directly, how do you plan on not encountering those issues on this project and we were, we were very satisfied with their answers. Commissioner Agnew. Uh, thank you and through you and appreciated the extra time, Councillor Stroud. Um, in reference to the question that you asked earlier, I was able to pull out the information relative to the specific revenue for this garage structure. It's about $250,000 annually associated that comes in uh, through the parking reserve fund. Uh, the other thing I would just identify for Council, this was part of the 15-year capital program that we presented during the budget process relative to the parking reserve fund and the projects that are on that were prioritized based on uh, condition assessment. So again, as Mr. Rempel identified, there is some emergency restoration that had to happen right away, but this is part of the broader capital program and was prioritized and, and presented as such. But certainly your comments about uh, wanting to seek more information about the nature of the company. And, and yes, it's unfortunate we were not able to get a greater pool of bidders, but I, I do know and I can certainly um, attest to the fact that the construction industry is very busy in Kingston. Councillor Doherty, anything else? Okay. Is there anybody else on this? Okay, so we'll call the vote on Clause 1. All those in favour? 
Opposed? Uh, and that carries by a vote of um, 11 to 1. Councillor Stroud opposed. Okay, Clause 2, Word of Contract Consulting Services for 100-Foot Park and 17-Point Crescent Shoreline and Park Improvements. Councillor Sanek. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, for this project for 17-Point Crescent, uh, I have a question. So right now, there's um, existing rock gabby and basket on the shore wall. And um, I guess with this project, like what more would they be looking at for that? It says there's gonna be public consultation. So would one of the, like, would one of the options be to actually give um, access for the residents to get into the water? Or is it just looking at which way more rock can um, stabilize the shoreline along 17 Park Crescent? Mr. Falwell. Thank you and through you um, to the councillor. Uh, the, the final solution hasn't been determined yet. So uh, certainly we know that the Gabion baskets are failing and uh, will need to be replaced. But what will be replaced in their, um, in their place has not been confirmed. And we do always try and provide some form of, of access. Um, and uh, although this, uh, this location is certainly prone to high wind and wave action, we'll just want to be careful that we're not recommending or promoting public access to an unsafe area. So, but that would all come through the, the detailed design and certainly an opportunity for the public to be engaged and consulted on the, uh, the, the project before uh, final designs are adopted and then put to construction. Thank you. Thank you, and um, second question is, um, as far as bringing in um, the ecological aspect of it, it's going to be like looking to see what effect it would have on um, the aquatic species in that area. Mr. Follow? Yes, thank you, and through you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor. So both for um, Point Crescent and uh, 100 Foot Park, we would be looking at those eco ecological components um, and that would be considered as part of the design. Okay, thank you. Anybody else on clause two? All those in favor? Opposed? That carries by vote 11 to one. Councillor Osanic opposed. Okay, on to clause three, amendments to Brownfield tax assistance approvals for two North Block projects. Uh, Councillor McLaren. Thank you. Um, I have a bit of a problem with this. Um, so, but I'd just like to ask a few questions to confirm. If we were to vote this down, is there an agreement in place right now? Okay, there are, there are two staff people that have raised their hands. I just can't see who they are. Okay, uh, Mr. McClatchy, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. Um, there are two approvals in place for the two projects. So the approvals were made by council in 2016. Um, the one project, 5157 Queen Street, has a brownfield site agreement that has been um, signed by both parties. The other project, 18 Queen Street, uh, does not yet have a brownfield site agreement completed. Um, the completion of that agreement was put on hold once the uh, once the uh, appeals got underway. Okay, so we do have one for one property and I imagine we can negotiate this. So this, this report here is an actual negotiation for the second one, but I'm curious as to the uh, text says that we're changing it from, for both of them, uh, we're increasing one by 23% and one by 13%. Where are we, which one of those is not settled? Mr. McClatchy? Through you, Mr. Mayor, through you, Mr. Mayor uh, it is the, uh, the uh, 13, my report here, the second one, the 13 point some odd percent uh, is, it's settled in terms of approvals. It just, and the, uh, the uh, Brownfield site agreements have been completed, but they haven't been signed. Okay, so we essentially have an agreement, and if we were to vote this down, that original agreement would be signed without the proposed amendments today, is that correct? That's my understanding, that we could proceed to completing that agreement based on the approvals that were provided in 2016. Okay, that actually sounds good to me. So if we have an approval already, and it's already going to go through, what we seem to be doing here um, is 
subsidizing a billion dollar company with an extra roughly 1.6 million dollars. Um, Homestead has paid a lot of money on and sunk costs into this, but 1.6 million doesn't seem to be something that they cannot afford. I know that they've recently sold a lot of buildings in my area and are probably flush with cash. I at least believe that. But um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, to the city staff again, um, do we have any financial pressures as a result of inflation? CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and <clears throat> through you, Mr. Mayor. So I, I think those are, might be different and separate questions. Uh, Councilor McLaren, if you're asking, generally speaking, does the city have any pressure in terms of inflation? Of course, like any other organization in business, but the Brownfield program is separate and different uh, from that because it is also um, funded and subsidized by uh, new, obviously, uh, construction and, and taxes coming into uh, to the city. So, mm -hmm. um, one wouldn't impact the other. Well, if it's subsidized by construction and taxes coming into the city, it would seem that therefore we may have a little bit less in the tax base to spend. And my reasoning is that if we have, if we think that inflation might be a problem for our budget, I believe the. The report says that this is a minor manageable amount over a 10-year term for the budget, but considering that inflation is coming, uh, every little bit helps, and I think it would be better to leave it with the public rather than to pad what appears to me uh, private corporation's bottom line. So I think we have an agreement in place. I don't think that they're going to not build this because of uh, 1.6, which is my calculation. Uh, so I'm going to be voting against this. I think the money is better left in our hands as opposed to um, their hands. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Councillor Kiley? Thank you, Mayor Patterson. And through you, I'm wondering if staff could explain from a policy perspective how the figures are derived. Where do we get these numbers from? Why the increase at this time? Commissioner Hugamas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you, Councillor Kiley. So the, the numbers are derived from the estimates that are provided by the applicants to the Brownfields program, and they are determined to be a maximum amount of rebate that can be provided out of the incremental taxes that are uh, received by the city once the development is complete. Um, has a has an occupancy permit and the development starts to actually pay the taxes in full and then the rebates start to to flow back to the to the applicant so the amounts are determined by a list of eligible costs which uh, can be applied to uh, remediating a site this site uh, both, both of these sites on Queen Street happen to be in the targeted project area 1a of the uh, city's brownfields CIP which is the um, uh, uh, a targeted area for for cleanup. So the whole policy was based around um, seeing these types of sites be be uh, be remediated through this program. Um, this is a, a unique case, uh, having an appeal period of, of delay of almost seven years. Uh, so keeping with recent practice of, uh, of of an appeal period of that length, uh, the city has received a revised. Um, estimates uh, of those cleanup costs because the the previous estimates were, were submitted back in 2016. Uh, so that um, uh, just recognizes the the lengthy delay period uh, that uh, that the applicant has seen uh, over this time. Okay, thank you. And through you, Mayor Patterson, two follow ups from that response, which is helpful for me. When you say eligible costs, it's purely for the remediation, or does it also have to do with construction of whatever the proposal is? For, for sure. So I, I can start, and, and Mr. McClatch, you might be able to uh, hand out, but the eligible costs are related to the actual remediation of the property, not the physical construction of, of the building. Um, the uh, applicant can uh, incur those costs if it's uh, deemed eligible as part of the agreement. Um, and 
and after they incur those costs, they have to submit um, uh, full audited statements and, and showing sign-offs from qualified persons in the, uh, in the remediation engineering field uh, from a third party that show that those costs were incurred um, and staff review those before any rebates are provided. But it, the, the eligible costs are, for all intents and purposes, counselor, related to directly remediating the property itself and, and cleaning it up so the no longer poses the threat that it, that it does now. Sure, okay, thank you. And then my second follow-up question was about um, the timeline. You mentioned the seven-year delay in this case. We know the reasons here are to do with tribunal appeals and so forth, the planning process, but what if a developer were to wait until the end of the term of their initial Bramfield agreement and then ask for um, a renewal or an extension? What are the kind of internal reasons why we had grant an extension are there other cases where this could happen? So, uh, thank you, Councillor Kiley. Good question. Um, yeah. So, if 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 we weren't here tonight and the applicant went through and then was running out of time, uh, the applicant could always uh, come forward to to council to to extend those timelines. Uh, that hasn't happened. Uh, Mr. Bacacci can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe that's happened um, in any of the previous, you know, dozen or 15 files that, that have come through for, for Brownfields. Um, but um, uh, with this uh, um, length of, of, of time, uh, there were there the only, there was one other example, the 223 Princess, where uh, that was a lengthy. Uh, delay through appeals process, um, and council recently uh, approved that a much smaller remediation scope, uh, just about a million dollars. But um, we did uh, receive the estimates uh, updated uh, to this year uh, in finalizing uh, that application for 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 that property. But again, a, a much smaller scale, uh, but was updated based on the the new new uh, um, new costs. Okay, thank you. And supplemental, my final question, we'll be bringing those two ideas together, is why do we not anticipate um, prolonged periods of remediation, especially when a proposal is outside of the bylaw? In other words, shouldn't we kind of presume that there will be appeals um, at the tribunal and in turn bake that into the initial agreement as opposed to have these kind of revisions as we go along? Is that something to consider? Um. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Kyle. Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, that's a good point. I, I I know that this this length of delay is is very uncommon across the province. Uh, this is not a typical length of delay. Of course, appeals can happen and um, can re result in delays, and those have not changed previous agreements because they are significantly less time. Um, regardless of whether there's an appeal period or not. Um, all applicants to the Brownfields program um, do have to carry the cost of that money, that investment, the remediation throughout the project. So uh, in this case, there's no uh, uh, a financing eligible cost, if, if you will. So the, the applicants need to pay all of the remediation costs up front, uh, then all the construction costs, uh, and then um, occupy the, the site pay all their taxes for the first full year and then start getting rebates over a 10-year period which are then not adjusted for any sort of a uh, time value of money so the the price is fixed uh, once the agreement is set and um, they get paid out over a, a maximum of 10 years and that doesn't kick in until uh, taxes are starting to get paid on the property so i know it doesn't fully answer or uh, directly address your question but i think it speaks to the nature of the processes already um in the favor of the city as far as there no money is rebated from the incremental taxes until all of it is built and taxes are paid so all of that all that cost is on the applicant all right thank you Dr. mayor hill thank you and through you your worship to mr hugenboss the uh um, the, the cost, the increased cost here is, I'm, I'm assuming that's because that's the anticipated cost of the remediation. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, those are updated numbers based on estimates for the remediation of these two properties. So if, if the remediation is completed and the costs are, are substantially less, then the city would not be, the city would pay the lesser amount in, or rebate the lesser amount, I should say. That, 
that is correct. So these are always setting the maximums. So the, no matter um, how much remediation costs, the maximum will, it will not exceed what this amount is. However, if the remediation costs less, then that's the amount that will be rebated. Again, all of the costs have to be uh, shown to have been incurred, validated by uh, qualified professionals, and, and submitted to the city for review before any rebate. So correct, Councillor Hill, if the costs come in less, the rebate is less. So what we're looking at here really is just, uh, we're, we're simply adjusting the actual cost of the remediation, which is, what our policy is all about because if we don't pay for the remediation there is no incentive for the developer to remediate the land they simply build where they don't need to remediate is that sort of the intent absolutely so the intent of the policy which i believe again was was the first in ontario at kingston uh did approve was to uh, promote and uh, incent the development of these properties, particularly in the downtown core, uh, where transportation and housing, transportation exists, services exist, and housing is is uh, desired. Um, so, but the the limiting factor, the detractor, was the cost of cleanup. So this is about leveling that playing field. It's right in the policy that council has uh, has approved um, to do that. So this is in a, in alignment with that policy 100%. So, so I, I guess in fairness, you know, this is our policy. We should follow our policy. Otherwise, you know, uh, I think we're, what we're suggesting to other developers is, uh, you know, don't trust us because we're going to step in and, and we're going to, we're going to, you know, uh, reduce your costs halfway through the project. So I, th that's not the, 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 the intent of this policy. The intent of this policy is to fairly remunerate uh, or remunerate uh, the developer for brownfield development, which is exactly what we want to have happen. So this, this is just uh, 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 playing fair, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else on Clause 3? Councillor Hutchison? Thank you. Um, what the report says is that it, the costs are increased due to delays. And part of those delays are frankly due to the actions of uh, Homestead themselves. They applied to do a, a project that was outside, as I remember it, outside the zoning bylaw and outside the official plan. So depending the official plan part being matter of interpretation. But so I don't know why the city is paying for what appears to be all these delays. You've recosted, sure, but why is the public paying for that? I mean, it seems to me that this is a cost of doing business. If you're going to do business in that manner, and at the time I remember Quite clearly, they were blaming the city for the delays, which were there, originated with them. So, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, so, I don't know, I mean, they've requested this, who wouldn't? But that doesn't mean we have to accede to it. It's, uh, you know, um, you in a sense ran up your own costs, and then you're coming to us to make up the difference. I mean. That seems the cost of doing business to me, which is unfortunate. I'm not against extending the, um, the annual, the, the, the payback, because that's out of everybody's control to some extent. And besides, it sort of splits the difference. So it runs out the, the period of payback. So, um, but I can't see the money side at all. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Is there anybody else? Deputy Mayor, would you take the chair? I take the chair and recognize you. Uh, thank you. I, I'm just going to make a couple of short comments here. The Brownfields program is very, very important to the city. It provides an incentive for developers to take on contaminated property, which is always far more expensive, has more uncertainty, has more challenges. And quite frankly, without the Brownfields problem uh, program, there would be a number of properties that would just lay dormant for years. So this is good for the city because we get new housing out of it and we get tax revenue out of it rather than just having undeveloped properties sit there indefinitely. This is very much about fair play. We've heard very much from staff. This is only to compensate real costs that are incurred through remediation. 
if we play games with this, then we will essentially deter other developers in the future from taking on contaminated properties. For that reason, it's important for us to send the signal that, you know what, we all know it was a contentious development, we all know that there were people on both sides of this, but this is to maintain the integrity of the Brownfields program and what it's supposed to do. So for that reason, to send, to send a message that we want other contaminated properties to be cleaned up and redeveloped, that's why I think we should support this clause in front of us. Thank you very much. I return the chair. Uh, thank you. Next is Councillor Ostroff. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Patterson. I just want to thank you for those comments and also Councillor Hill. I think it's very important that we carry on with this and uh, we play fair and respectful to this development and uh, move forward with it. Thank you very much. Okay. We will call the vote on Clause 3. All those in favor? Opposed? And that loses on a tie. So the five that were in favor, Mayor Patterson, Councillor Osterhoff, Deputy Mary Hill, Councillor Bohm, and Councillor Neal. Okay, moving on to uh, clause number four. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, can we just redo the vote? All those in favor? Okay, sorry, I missed a hand. Six, opposed? Five. That passes six to five. Yes, no, I know. So I, I, missed, I missed your vote when I counted. There are 11 of us, so you're right. That's, that's why the discrepancy was. Thank you for that. So the five opposed, Councillor Osanic, Councillor McLaren, Councillor Kylie, Councillor Hutchison, and Councillor Doherty. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving on to clause number five. Noise exemption request 2800 Clogs Road. Uh, Councillor Chappelle. Councillor Chappelle, you wanted Clause 5 uh, separated? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just regarding the, the noise issues uh, that will take place at this construction development, I just wanted to clarify from staff that there will be no construction noise on Sundays or stat holidays. And I was wondering if they've had other examples where they've had construction noise conducted between 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. on evenings. If they can provide me examples where we gave exemptions of that nature. Uh, thank you. I think we have our uh, the city's new director of uh, enforcement, Mr. Smith, is here. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and through you. Uh, I cannot give you specific uh, examples of any that we have had between 7 and 9 p.m. Uh, other than MTO road work, perhaps, and, and the ferry dock. Uh, and I can confirm the first part of your question that, yes, indeed, there will be no uh, work approved for Sundays or statutory holidays. Okay. Thank you. So we will call the vote then on Clause 5. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carries by a vote of uh, 11 to 1. Oh, I'm sorry. Councillor Senate, you were opposed? Carries by a vote of 10 to 2. Councillor Sanic and Chappelle opposed. Okay. I don't think that there are anything, any clauses left in report uh, number 67. So we will move on to report number 68 from the CAO. Moved by Councillor Chappelle, seconded by Councillor Baum, that report number 68 from the Chief Administrative Officer recommend be received and adopted clause by clause. Okay, the first clause is update to blue box transition. Councillor Kiley. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. If you give me one moment, sorry, I wrote down my question on this. It's concerning the facility, and there is mention in the report of uh, evaluation needing to be completed for CARC itself. And I'm wondering how does that fit in terms of negotiating a deal with a potential um, collector of recycling? Like does what the facility does now, that was awkwardly worded, but does what we do there actually impact our ability to continue with recycling going forward? Uh, Ms. Antucci. Um, sorry, could you repeat that question? Yeah, sure. I'm just wondering, there is a mention about doing some type of valuation of CARC 
the facility. And I'm wondering how what we learn from that fits into our ability to negotiate with a potential new um, collector of recycling when we go to producer um, responsibility. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so that, that will allow us to get some uh, prices in terms of whether we decide we want to maybe lease our property, that that, that that lease value would then be able to incorporate it into um, our, the contractors looking to, to, to lease that, that area. We would have that information for them when the time came for those facilities to be leased. And so follow up to that is in that negotiation process, could it become a stranded asset where they want to do that business elsewhere and not at the current facility? That is always a possibility. There are very few facilities in the Kingston area and in Eastern Ontario. Um, we've been approached by people already asking about our facility. So I, I very strongly feel like there will be um, people that will be looking out for our facility be, just because of the lack of, um, of similar type of facilities in the area. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Okay, so anybody else on clause one? Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, clause two, community safety zones and school and neighborhood area speed limits. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Clause three, school street and play street program extension. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Clause four, Kingston Community Climate Action Fund funding agreements with nonprofit organizations. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Clause 5, COVID-19 vaccination policy recommendation. Uh, Councillor Ostroff. Sorry, Mayor Patterson, I just want to check something here. Um, if it was the right time for this question. It was just uh, the date for August 1st on, on there. Was that, was that on this part? I don't see it in my screen here. Was there a date for, um, for it to be implemented for August 1st? Uh, Commissioner Carboni? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Council, yes, it was August 1st. I'm just, just curious, is that a, a timeline? Is it, could, it, could it be like next week, or is it first because of payroll, or why is it delayed until August 1st? Just curious. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor, uh, I don't believe it's connected in any way to payroll or, or other processes. I think it was a date that allowed us time for appropriate communications. We do have staff that are off because of the policy, so yes. it gives us time for recall and communications to everyone. I understand. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hutchison. I'm fine with suspending the policy, which is the central part of the motion, but it's the underlying, the surrounding context of uh, growing, um, depends on where you read whether you've got growing hospitalizations or falling hospitalizations. It's got to do with time, scope that's being measured and so on. So I'm wondering if we could have the, um, the, um, the head of public health come and speak to us about what it seems to be developing according to a very lar a large article in the Toronto Star and other outlets of growing Omicron B5 um, growth in cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Insofar as under that variant, the problem isn't that, well, the problem has always been deaths, of course, and hospitalizations, but apparently B5 is so much more contagious that it will take in as many or about the same number of people will be affected because of the greater contagion. So I would like to get this straightened out, and I'm sure the public would too. And we've invited the public health prior to this. So is that a comment, or are you? I'm requesting you as head of council whether you'd be open to asking the uh, public health to come and 
present on this problem? So I think I think first we would ask staff have have staff been have has public health been consulted on this uh, on this recommendation? Uh, Commissioner Carboni. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, yes, we have been in touch with public health um, in the weeks and months leading up to this recommendation, and most recently, um, advising of uh, the staff's approach uh, being recommended here, and it is in line with current public health guidelines. The problem is, I knew that from the recommendation. What I don't know is what's developing and what we should be prepared for. Uh, CEO Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So, uh, Councillor Hutchison, I believe you're asking about uh, being able to have Dr. Oglaza come to a future meeting yeah. to talk about the COVID-19 situation, what we're, what we might see in future months right. or year. Um, the same way that I think uh, Dr. Moore used to attend some of our meetings to provide some information. So, separate from the policy, we can definitely request. Um, for Dr. Oglaza to attend a future meeting, uh, whether it's in August or later, depending on his availability. If that's possible, CAO says that's possible, then I'm fine with that. I mean, I know, I'll say this, none of us wants to go back to where we were, right? And uh, none of us enjoyed the experience, put it mildly. But, um, there are concerns out there, and coming from reliable sources, that there's a threat that it could come back because of the greater contagion of B5. So, a contagious effect. And so, um, again, I think it would be wise to do that. Okay, thank you. So we'll call the vote then on Clause 5. All those in favor? Opposed? And that carries by a vote of uh, 10 to 2. Councillor Neal and Stroud opposed. Okay, uh, moving on to report number 69 from the Arts, Recreation, and Community Policies Committee. Moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor Osanek, that report number 69 from the Arts, Recreation, and Community Policies Committee be received and adopted. Point, point of order. Point of order, Councillor Neal. Uh, I don't believe I voted against that. I thought I raised my hand on the previous vote in favor. Okay. Thank you. So we'll correct that vote to 11 to 1. Councillor Stroud opposed. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so on report number 69, would anyone like any of the clauses separated? Councillor Sanek? Thank you. The first one? The first one? Okay, so uh, first is Parks and Recreation Master Plan Information on Indoor, Outdoor, or Multisport. Uh, court and costs for future planning of aquatic facilities. Councillor Sanek. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you, uh, thank you to staff for um, bringing this back in time. You know, it came back to ARC at the end of June, just like we had instructed um, like a year, almost a year and a half ago uh, when this, when the master plan, the recreation master plan first came to ARC in April 2021. So at that time, we asked for more court service. And I have like no problem with expanding, you know, pickleball, tennis courts right across the city. Uh, what I always had a problem with was the consultant's recommendation at the master plan to um, reduce the number of courts in the West End and like we just saw a few months ago they released the census data and we saw that our population has grown seven percent and you know like since the master plan was first worked on back in 2020 uh, going through the process I think the master plan had even been delayed a bit by COVID so anyway now we're seven percent more population and I don't think the West End should see any reduction in courts at all so um, like last night I tried to play tennis I went to Compton Park first because that's where our, we're recommending lighting and uh, there was no room. Then we drove over to Henderson Courts and all 
know six courts were being used. Um, we waited there, like it's supposed to be a courtesy. If you see someone waiting there, whoever got on the courts last, supposed to wait, you know, 15 minutes or so and then get off to let the people waiting. No one exited the courts, right? And I was even wearing like neon colored running shoes. No one exited the courts. And so we had to drive home empty handed. We didn't get to play tennis. And so anyway, I do, so our courts are definitely used a lot during prime time. That's my um, conclusion there. Now, we do see for Henderson courts tonight's delegations that noise is a concern. Um, you know, we saw a pickleball first being on the upper courts. That was too close to the backyard. Staff then tried to compensate by moving the pickleball courts uh, closer to the parking lot at the bottom. And uh, I do have some amendments to make right now. I uh, just trying to help resolve that one and for some other um, of the courts. So I was just wondering, like, maybe now I should move the amendments. And if um, council wants to uh, vote on, there's four clauses, amendments, you want to do them one by one or do them all, I'm fine for all of them. So this is my amendments. Okay, thank you. So we'll just put everything up as one motion to amend, and then we can do separate votes by clauses if needed. So can I just see that on my screen? the uh, motion to amend. Thank you. Um, okay, so moved by Councillor Sanic, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that Clause 1, Report Number 69, be amended to add the following clauses. First, the two of the current pickleball line markings at Henderson Park remain until such time as the six proposed courts of the new Cataract Way West Community Park are complete and the 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. time of use restriction in the use of quiet paddles or foam balls be posted at Henderson Park in the interim. And two, that the use of quiet paddles or foam balls be posted at Bay Ridges Park's uh, new dedicated pick pickleball courts, and if noise complaints persist, then the four newly developed pickleball courts at Bay Ridge Park be converted to one tennis court and lines for two multi-use pickleball courts be retained. And three, that when lighting is installed at Compton Park, that a low sideline fence be built at the courts. And four, that the development of Bell Park be implemented as per the original Parks Recreation Master Plan recommendations, which called for eight dedicated pickleball courts and two tennis courts. Okay, so that motion to amend is on the floor. So, Councillor Senate, you can, so debate and discussion is with respect to all four clauses or any of the four. So, Councillor Senate, you can, um, you can speak to it. Great, thank you very much. So the first one for Henderson Court um, imposing a time of use restriction. Uh, speaking to the delegations tonight, so what's being proposed is 10 a.m. until 5 p.m. And that would give the residents uh, backing onto the courts time to have breakfast outside, you know, your coffee outside without having that woofing sound of um, the pickleball and also dinner and then evening in your backyard, you know, free of that noise. So um, that's what Henderson's about. Um, for the next one, for Bay Ridge Courts, they're going to be, oh, oh, and sorry, so what we also learned tonight was there is the quieter foam ball, which they say is used indoors. So if we also restrict that to Henderson pickleball playing, they have to have the foam ball, or also um, they could just use um, the quiet paddle. So they have a quiet paddle and they have a quiet ball. The quiet paddle would be like a polycore um, or aluminum core paddle ball, <laughs> or pad paddle is supposed to be much quieter. All these things we're learning about pickleball. So anything to make the play quieter, <laughs> we can try to use at Henderson. And, uh, and then Bay Ridge is gonna be opening up very shortly. So the second clause for the amendment was to also say, for those four dedicated courts about to open at Bay Ridge uh, Park, it should be the same um, because I know staff are anticipating some noise complaints uh, just because we've already started getting noise complaints for Bay Ridge and no one's even played there yet. So if we start with the foam balls and, uh, you know, the paddles, the quiet paddles, maybe we won't get any noise complaints for Bay Ridge. I have my fingers crossed as those are about to open. And, uh, and then if we did get noise complaints um, at Bay Ridge, uh, what they say is later on, then um, those four dedicated courts will be reduced down to a tennis court with then lining on the south side being for to um, uh, multi-use play of tennis or 
pickleball, the problem with lining, so I hope we don't get to the lining with this requirement for a quiet ball or a quiet paddle. The problem is if you're a tennis player and then you have also all these pickleball lines, it gets really psychedelic. Like when you're playing, you just like, it's, it's like you almost get a headache every time you look down. Um, I think you have to experience it to understand what I'm talking about, but hopefully there's a lot of nods in the audience going, yep, I know what you mean. And and uh, it's probably the same way for the pickleball players when they're using multi-lined, uh, you know, interfering with the tennis lines, probably causing them a headache as well. So that's what that one's about. For Compton Park, um, the sides of Compton Park, they have two courts there. There's actually no... Um, there's no fence at all. And what we're proposing is in a few years' time to put lighting, actually activate the lighting for Compton Park. So the problem is if you're a hacker, like I'm not a competitive tennis player, but I love to hit the ball. And so if you go off the sidelines, right, and you have the uh, lights on those courts, your ball is going to go flying out to the darkness, and you might never see it again until the next day when a dog comes by and, you know, takes it and, you know, for playing. So you're going to lose tennis balls, in my opinion. So um, what staff are recommending is that when the lighting does go up at Compton Park, that there's um, a fencing along the sides of Compton Park uh, courts there. And then the last thing is about uh, Bell Park. So um, last April 2021, when we discussed this at ARC, uh, we did not know that the Tennis Clubs of Canada were going to be proposing their indoor facility that's going to be open up this winter on high Highway 15, nor did we know that the Kingston Pickleball Club is going to be opening up their private indoor facility um, in the West End. And so we were looking for tournament play, and that's why we were rushing ahead, um, uh, expediting um, four additional pickleball courts at Bell Park. Now that we have that added information since that time, we're just going to stick with the original Bell Park master plan, which was for, um, let me see, it was for for eight, it was for eight dedicated pickleball courts and two tennis courts, and that's my time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, anybody on the amendment? Councilor Doherty. I just would like a clarification. Uh, I, I'm not, I don't know much about pickleball, and you mentioned, and, and perhaps the delegation spoke to this, but the uh, quiet ball and the quiet paddle, you mentioned that that would, that is used inside, is is that just as good outside, or like, why don't they use it outside? Um, I'm not sure why they don't use it outside. They say you can use it outside, but um, it's, it is a little bit different feel um, when you're playing with that ball um, versus the woofer ball that they so use. So we're not introducing something that may um, uh, interfere with the game? They just can't use indoor balls um, in official tournaments outside. Okay, thank you. Deputy Mayor Hill. Thank you, and I, and I'm, I was very pleased to hear from the uh, president of the Pickleball Association that they are willing to work with residents around this because it is very distracting for some of our residents. And, and you know, in fairness to them, they were there before the pickleball folks were there. So, uh, you know, I can see why they would be upset about it. And this, I think, is a very fair compromise uh, that we can try. And if it doesn't work, then we might have to find some other kinds of solutions. But uh, in the meantime, as we move toward more facilities, and I think I absolutely concur with uh, Councillor Osanic that we need a lot more in the West End, and hopefully located in, in areas that are, are not as close to residential areas as Henderson and Bay Ridge courts are. But... In the meantime, this is, a, this is a good workable solution, I think, that will address most of the concerns of the residents and most of the concerns of uh, the Pickleball Association. And if someone does want to use, uh, uh, you know, an outdoor paddle and ball, then there are other courts that they can access. So, so it's, I think it's, it's, it, it really works uh, both ways, and we'll certainly know that uh, uh, after we've been able to implement it. So I will be supporting the amendments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Chappelle. Thank you, Your Worship. I would just like to uh, provide some accolades to uh, Councillor Sanic for the outstanding efforts she made to find uh, very reasonable compromises to ensure the active participation of many of our residents and uh, utilization of some great assets the city has to offer. So thank you, Councillor Sanic. I'll be supporting this motion. 
Okay, anybody else on the amendment? Councillor Stroud? I will support the amendment. I just want to point out a high-level conundrum that Pickleball has presented us with, and pretty much everything we ever say about Pickleball is going to come back to this, this high-level principle. If you have public space, it needs to be shared. Shared space. So uh, Pickleball was first presented as something that was compatible with tennis, that used the same facilities as tennis, and both could coexist. I'm starting to think that's not really that true. It's one or the other, because what Councillor Rosanek was saying about the lines, and now we hear all these complaints about the noise. Tennis doesn't generate those complaints. The, the tennis ball doesn't make the, that noise. The tennis racket doesn't make that noise. I don't, I don't know if that's coincidence, if it's by luck, but tennis was accepted worldwide for a reason, and if pickleball wants to do the same thing, they're going to have to figure out about this noise problem with, from, from the rackets, because... Uh, here we are, you know, debating in Kingston, and this same debate's happening across North America. The same debate, the same thing, because shared space needs to be shared, and you can't have purpose-built pickleball courts everywhere. Maybe in Florida they do, you know, uh, they have a lot of private facilities in, in Florida. But we're talking about public facilities, and every time uh, someone proposes to do something that's only good for one sport in a public uh, field, you're going to have the same problem. I mean, it'd be the same if it's... Um, Rugby, football, soccer, like all those that need to coexist. And it's the same thing here with tennis and pickleball and, and, and just having it in the parks. We are finding compromises, but this is going to keep coming up. And pickleball, the pickleball uh, associations need to, need to fix this, in my opinion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else on the amendment? Councillor Hutchison. Um, yeah, I just want to say that I support... Um, or pickleball courts in the West End. Um, I, one of my concerns, though, is with the last of that clause. And I just wanted to know, I, wanted, I think Mr. Fulwell was on earlier. I wanted to be ensured that the original um, um, amendment to the Parks and Recreation Master Plan included eight pickleball courts and two tennis courts. And then the proposal that came up at ARC suggested more pickleball courts. So first of all, I want to know if I've got that right. Because that's what that is based on. Mr. Fuller? Uh, no, thank you and three of Mr. Mayor. So the original Bell Park Master Plan um, was built into three phases for implementation. And the first phase of implementation included eight dedicated pickleball courts and two tennis courts. As part of the direction from council at the approval of the Parks and Rec Master Plan, um, we received um, the direction to speed up the implementation specifically at Bell Park to add in the future phase three four additional pickleball courts as part of that implementation. So the motion to amend that's in front of you would revert back to the original Bell Park Master Plan implementation. Good. I, I agree with that. I just You put it much better than I could have. But um, so then will we be able to in, uh, initiate the first phase of the Bell Park Master Plan? Is, are you saying that? I just want to be clear. Thank you and through you, uh, Mr. Mayor. So uh, further uh, information on Bell Park in the report also suggests splitting phase one into A and B, which would allow for phase 1A, the tennis and pickleball and some parking components and reconfiguration of, of the major site amenities would happen one year sooner than the current implementation for the overall broader phase one, um, which is split into B, which would be some of the play structures, uh, further uh, dog park improvements, trail improvements. Uh, that would still fall in uh, 2025, but we're suggesting as part of this report to bring the court component one year sooner. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there's no other discussion, we will call the vote on the amendment. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, so now we're back to uh, Clause 1 as amended. Is there any further discussion? Okay, we'll call the vote then. All those in favor? 
Opposed? And that's carried. Uh, now there are two other clauses. Uh, number two, station location study and response time optimization assessment. And clause three, excuse me, preliminary project scope, Kingston Memorial Center, community hub revitalization project phase one. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, on to report number 70 from the Environment, Infrastructure, and Transportation Policies Committee. Moved by Councillor Stroud, seconded by Councillor Neal, that report number 70 from the Environment, Infrastructure, and Transportation Policies Committee be received and adopted. Okay, there's just the uh, one clause, Climate Leadership Plan, Community Engagement Strategy, and Appointment of Climate Leadership Working Group. Councillor Carley? Thank you, Mayor Patterson, through you. I just wanted to be sure for complete clarity that we're talking about appointing the group in question, not actually agreeing to targets at this point. This is about finding the right organizations to be on the climate leadership. Ms. Salter Keen. Uh, thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor, that's correct. It's to appoint the uh, working group, and with the working group, we will look at the targets and report back to council. Perfect, thank you. Okay, uh, we will call the vote then on clause one. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Report number 71 from the Nominations Advisory Committee. Moved by Councillor Stroud, seconded by Deputy Mayor Hill, that report number 71 from the Nominations Advisory Committee be received and adopted. So there is the one clause, public appointments to committees and boards. Uh, first, at the following appointments to the Election Audit Compliance Committee, uh, from September 30th to November 15th, 2026, be approved. Uh, Gail Dowsett, Gail McAllister, and Jonathan Rose. Uh, and then also that Mark Asberg be appointed to the Kingston Frontenac Public Library Board for term ending November 14th. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, report number 72 from Planning Committee. Moved by Councillor Kiley, seconded by Deputy Mayor Hill, that report number 72 from the Planning Committee be received and adopted. Uh, there's just the one clause approval of application for final plan of condominium 809 Development Drive. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, uh, we have nothing from Committee of the Whole. Uh, we have one information report, tender and contract awards subject to the established criteria for delegation of authority for the month of May 2022. We have no information reports. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Chappelle, you have questions? Just for uh, clarification, delegated authority. Uh, there's currently a public consultation going on about change in delegated authority to increase it from fifty dollars to $100,000, and I'm encouraging residents in Kingston to participate in the online survey. Thank you. That wasn't really a question for that report, but thank you for that. Okay, uh, moving on. No information reports to members of council. Miscellaneous business. Uh, we have uh, two motions. Uh, first, moved by Councillor Osanic, seconded by Deputy Mayor Hill. Uh, that is requested by Marissa Goujon, City Hall and Springer Market Square, be lit in blue and pink on October 15th, 2022, for Pregnancy and Infant Loss Remembrance Day. Number two, moved by Councillor Osterhoff, seconded by Councillor Bohm that the resignation of Councillor Holland from Tourism Kingston and Kingston Access Services be received with regret. There are also two additional uh, uh, clauses uh, if there are any volunteers to take either of those two positions. If not, then I just propose that we will just call a vote on the first clause and the other two can be, well, Mr. Clerk, well, we'll just defer it to the next meeting. That's what we do, right? Okay, okay so, uh, so first, then uh, on the first uh, miscellaneous motion and the first clause of the second miscellaneous motion, all those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Can I have a motion to defer the remaining two clauses to the August meeting? Moved by Councillor Stroud, seconded by Deputy Mayor Hill. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Okay, we have no new motions tonight. Are there any notices of motion? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Deputy Clerk Ross, for minutes, please. Moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Osanek, that the minutes of City Council meeting number 16-2022, held Tuesday, June 21st, 2022, be confirmed. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. There's some tabling of documents, number of communications. Is there any other business? Uh, Mr. Deputy Clerk, cross for bylaws, please. 
Moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor Oosterhoff, that bylaws 1 through 8, 16 through 19, and 15 be given their first and second reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor Oosterhoff, that clause 12.63 of bylaw number 2021-41 be suspended for the purpose of giving bylaws 1, 2, and 5 through 8, three readings. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor Oosterhoff, that bylaws 1, 2, and 5 through 14, 16 through 18, and 15 be given their third reading. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Motion to adjourn, please. Moved by Councillor Bohm, seconded by Councillor McLaren. All those in favor? Opposed? And we are adjourned. Thank you very much.